The Quran that came way after the Old Testament and the New Testament says that no one should associate a partner with Allah because Allah is one and He alone is God according to Islam. And if anyone shares Allah's deity or oneness with another, for example saying Allah has a son or you know making Allah out to be three, then that person commits shirk or sharik. Sharik means uh, a partner. And we know according to the Quran, Allah has no partners. So by committing shirk, you are then committing the sin that is unforgivable according to the Quran. <clears throat> Allah forgives not that partners should be set up with him, but he forgives anything else to whom he pleases. To set up partners with Allah is to devise a sin most heinous indeed. And Surah 4, 116 says the same thing also. So Allah forgives anything else, but this is the one sin that He will not forgive. And it's funny because a lot of Muslims come to me or post comments on our videos saying, you know, come back to Islam, repent, and Allah will forgive you. No. This is the sin that is unforgivable according to Islam. Allah will not forgive the sin. Not that He has power to forgive, but <clears throat> that's a whole different topic. So again, what is shirk? It's including a partner with Allah <clears throat> or sharing Allah's authority or position with another. Now, don't get me wrong, God is one because the Bible tells us God is one. Throughout the Bible, we see God as a more complex being than what we think He is. In Genesis, we see God creating the heavens and the earth. Then we see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters and then we see the Word of God who is Christ active in creation something we see all throughout the Bible one God three persons what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the scriptures to elaborate more on how God is distinct in persons yet one in being or essence we see God the Father uh, calling himself uh, a father to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, we see a prophecy in Isaiah of a son being born whose name will be called Mighty God, uh, Counselor, and Everlasting Father. And thirdly, we see God saying in Genesis 6, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. And God said this because he felt grieved in his heart because of man's wickedness on the earth. This is the same spirit that was promised and given to the people in the New Testament um, after Christ resurrected and promised the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit of God. By the Son being called uh, Mighty God, Counselor, and Everlasting Father in Isaiah 9, uh, we see unity in the triune being of God who is one in essence. We read King David uh, calling the Lord God our Father in the Old Testament. We see the Lord God appear to Abraham in human physical form where he spoke to Abraham uh, face to face in Genesis chapter 18. And thirdly, we see Job in the Old Testament saying, The Spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Round 3. In Psalm 45, we see God referring to the Messiah as God. God says to the Messiah, this is God speaking here, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you. And thirdly, we see that we see in the Old Testament that a time will come where the Holy Spirit of God uh, will be poured out into the hearts of believers. The best of creation is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, without a doubt. The highest in rank of all the messengers, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The one whom we hope for and pray for, his intercession on the day of judgment, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He has such a privilege and such an honor. We, we acknowledge it and we will only be considered believers if we acknowledge that. And people say, we're all worshiping the same God. Well. Christians say you have to believe in Jesus to go up. In Islam, they have an unforgivable sin called shirk, and they say if you believe in Jesus, you're condemned to hell. So question, how can the same God say if you believe in Jesus, you go up, and if you believe in Jesus, you go down? Either God is schizophrenic 
or we're talking about two different gods. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive the one who commits shirk with him. Allah does not forgive the one who associates partners with him. We define the word shirk and we said linguistically, literally it means association or to make partners. So to make partners or literally to association or sharing. And in terms of Islamically, simply, basically what it means is to give a share to others of what is only due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything which is due to Allah alone, if you give it to the creation, be a man or a stone, a stone, a stone, a stone, a stone. A stone. Major shirk which is clear, the people who worship idols, the people who worship Buddha and they worship, you know, the Sikhs and the Hindus and the Christians, etc. This is open, clear, apparent major shirk. <laughs> Mohammedan Islam basing its monotheism on that of the Israelites and their Torah strongly opposes idolatry, polytheism and associating anything or anyone with God. This contrasts sharply with the contention by Muhammad's Arab contemporaries who believe that Allah had associates. Some of these associates are mentioned in the Quran. Among them are three female deities, Al-Lat, Al-Uzza, Wal-Manat who were, according to the religious beliefs of the pagan Arabs, the daughters of Allah, the supreme deity of the Kaaba. Each had a shrine in separate places, not far from Mecca in Arabia, where Muhammad was born and began his mission. Although the Quran in its present form obviously rejects these deities, Muslim history asserts otherwise. The Islamic records assert that Muhammad actually spoke Satan's words as if they were the words of Allah. This event is documented by several early Muhammadan scholars and is referenced in the Hadith and the Quran. Later Muhammadan scholars, ashamed and embarrassed that their self-declared prophet spoke Satan's words, denied the event occurred. A myriad of excuses and contorted stories have been put forth by these later scholars to cover up Muhammad's sinful error. It must be very clearly pointed out that the Satanic Verses event is not something made up by non-Muslims. The event is recorded by the earliest Islamic sources available reporting on Muhammad's life. No one should think that it is a story made up by people who are critical of Islam. It is an episode directly found in the early Islamic records. This subject is one of the most controversial in Muhammadan Islam because allegedly Satan was able to deceive Muhammad and thus insinuate himself in the Quran by causing Muhammad to recite his words as if they were Allah's words. Muhammadans always use the mantra, bring forth the proof. Well, the proof is as follows. This event is actually documented by the four early biographical writers of Muhammad's life. Ibn Ishaq's Sirat Rasulullah, Al-Waqidi, Ibn Sa'ad's Kitab al-Tabaqat al-Kabir, and Tabari's History. The Hadith and Quran also contain direct references. Additionally, several other Islamic scholars on Hadith, called traditions, support the event's occurrence, such as Ibn Abi Hatim, Ibn al-Mundhir, Ibn Marduya, Musa Ibn Uqba, and Abu Ma'shar. It is all the more strange that Ibn Hajar, a recognized authority on traditions, 
insists on the truth of this report and says, as we have mentioned above, three of its chain of narrators satisfy the conditions requisite for an authentic report. Because of time constraints, we shall explore Al-Tabari's version of the events, and those who need more detail should go to our definition section in our website. Tabari, Volume 6, Point 107. Satan casts a false revelation on the Messenger of Allah's tongue. The Messenger of Allah was eager for the welfare of his people and wished to effect a reconciliation with them in whatever ways he could. He longed in his soul that something would come to him from Allah which would reconcile him with his tribe. With his love for his tribe and his eagerness for their welfare, it would have delighted him if some of the difficulties which they made for him could have been smoothed out. And he debated with himself and fervently desired such an outcome. Then Allah revealed. Chapter 53, verse 19. Have ye thought upon Allah and Al-Uzza, and Manat the third, the other? At this very moment, Satan allegedly cast on his tongue, because of his inner debates, and what he desired to bring to his people, the words. These are the exalted Gharaniq, whose intercession is to be hoped for. When the Quraysh heard this, they rejoiced and were happy and delighted at the way in which he spoke of their gods. And they listened to him. While the Muslims, having complete trust in their Prophet in respect of the messages which he brought from Allah, did not suspect him of error, illusion or mistake. When he came to the prostration, Having completed the surah, he prostrated himself and the Muslims did likewise, following their prophet, trusting in the message which he had brought and following his example. Those polytheists of the Quraysh and others who were in the mosque likewise prostrated themselves because of the reference to their gods which they had heard, so that there was no one in the mosque, believer or unbeliever, who did not prostrate himself. The Quraysh left delighted by the mention of their gods, which they had heard saying, Muhammad has mentioned our gods in the most favorable way possible, stating in his recitation that they are the high-flying cranes, Gharanaq, and that their intercession is received with approval. It is very important to point out here and now that Muhammad and his Muslim followers were prostrating themselves and praying in a purely pagan mosque, a house of idolatry, since they were surrounded by the rock gods of the Quraysh. Muhammad should not have done so at all as an alleged monotheist. This only shows that he was always willing to compromise his beliefs until such time as he could overcome or destroy all those who did not believe as he did, as in fact he eventually achieved. Then Gabriel came to the Messenger of Allah and said, Muhammad, what have you done? You have recited to the people that which I did not bring to you from Allah, and you have said that which was not said to you. Then the Messenger of Allah was much grieved and feared Allah greatly, but Allah sent down a revelation to him, for he was merciful to him, consoling him and making the matter light for him, informing him that there had never been a prophet or a messenger before him who desired as he desired and wished as he wished but that Satan had cast words into his recitation, as he had cast words on Muhammad's tongue. Then Allah cancelled what Satan had thus cast, and established his verses by telling him that he was like other prophets and messengers, and replaced the offending satanic verses with, What? For you the male sex and for him the female? Behold, such would be indeed a division most unfair. The question that any inquisitive mind will ask is, how many other verses in the Qur'an were actually revealed to Muhammad by Satan and not Gabriel? The satanic verses also destroy another challenge in the Qur'an. Surah Bani Israel, chapter 17, verse 88 say, If the whole of mankind and jinn were put together to produce the like of this Qur'an, they could not produce the like thereof, even if they backed up each other with help and support. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear from the above that in desperation and in a moment of weakness, Muhammad was willing to compromise his monotheism by conceding to allow the daughters of Allah to remain as intercessor 
in his Islam. That is, he was willing to allow three other associates with Allah. Muhammad actually sinned, and all the excuses that we read and all the explanations are used to hide a very simple fact. Muhammad kafara because he associated other gods with Allah. When he realized the enormity of what he had done, he repented, and to rectify his error, he first accused the innocent Satan of having tricked him, and then revealed the very conveniently descended abrogating verses, followed by others in which Allah only admonished him and made light banter of his enormous sin. Neither Satan, Gabriel, nor Allah were involved. It was all Muhammad at his very best, deceitful, wily, beguiling, and very much in control of his mostly very superstitious, ignorant, fearful, illiterate, and totally obedient flock. We continuously see God as three persons, yet one God in essence. We see God the Father. We see many times God appearing as a man on earth, where people in the Old Testament saw the form of the Lord. And we now know that bodily form was Christ in the flesh, the Son of God. And thirdly, we see the Holy Spirit of God upon the people of God, guiding them and inside the hearts of believers all throughout the Bible. Scripture says that no one can see God and yet live. Yet people have seen God. They haven't seen God the Father who is in heaven, but they've seen God the Son who is God revealed to us in physical form, in human physical form, natural form for our eyes to see. We know it wasn't the Father who came in the flesh. The Bible tells us that it was the Son who came in bodily form and died on the cross. God is complex in His unity and since the beginning and in the inception, uh, God has been revealed to us as uh, three persons. That doesn't mean He's three gods. He's one God in three persons. Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus also said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Almighty. Something God refers to Himself as in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah. Philippians 2 tells us that um, God left His throne and His glory in heaven, um, came down to earth in the likeness of men, made Himself of no reputation, and died on the cross. This can obviously only be speaking of one person, and that is the Messiah, the Christ. If Jesus was a created being, then we would have a shirk problem or an issue where we're placing a created being beside God Almighty. But Jesus refers to himself as the Almighty. And we see that God left his throne and his glory and revealed himself as a man. In my eyes, the ones who are committing shirk are not the Christians, it's the Muslims. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulallah. Meaning, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. This is the official Muslim testimony of faith, or Shahada. Muslims say in order for a person to truly be a believer of Islam, they must profess that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is Allah's Messenger. So, is believing in Allah without the Muhammad part not sufficient for salvation in Islam? Why is Muhammad's name, a created being, positioned right beside the name of Allah, who is the self-sufficient, the eternal God of the universe? I see a partnership there, whether you like it or not. Why must Muhammad's name be included? Did Muhammad claim to be God? Also, doesn't the Quran say Allah makes no distinction between any of his messengers? That's clearly making a distinction. So why place Muhammad's name right there beside Allah? Why not place Moses' name there, or Jesus? It doesn't matter if Muhammad was the final messenger according to Islam. Fact is, it goes against the Quran, and you shouldn't make distinctions. And you can imagine that if there is indeed an unpardonable sin, Satan is the father of lies. He is a liar, he is a slanderer. The idea is, clearly from Jesus, that you get to a point where you have rejected light, and that's it. Even though you still have physical life left, that's it. There's never forgiveness. For if we go on sinning, there's the rejection. You go on sinning. You choose sin 
over Christ. Listen, the unpardonable sin, the sin that leads unto death, is where we so resist and reject the light of the Spirit of God that it grieves Him so thoroughly that He withdraws from ever bringing into that individual convicting power so that they're never, never able to repent and be forgiven. Deliberately rejecting Christ, there is only, for all of us, only one path to heaven. There's only one. We do have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Only one way to God. And it's by coming to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you will, come. If you're thirsty, drink. If you're hungry, eat. He said, if you need rest, I will give it if you come to me. Him that comes, I'll never cast out. That's what he says. If somebody asked me, will Jesus Christ save somebody who's committed the unpardonable sin, I will say, he can if he has. You say, what do you mean? I mean this. No matter what you think you've committed, if you run to Christ and fall square into His arms, and He whispers, I love you, you are forgiven, then I don't care what you've committed, and I don't care what you think you've done, and I don't care how much you were convinced you commit, committed the unpardonable sin. If He'll forgive you for it, then you're forgiven. And there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way. There's nobody going to be in heaven except they repent of their sins and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no justification for anybody except those who will run to Christ, to go to Him, to find rest in Him. And He promises that if, the, if you go, you will find satisfaction. You will find something there to drink that will lead to eternal life. You will find rest. You will truly find it. And that is the only way to heaven. And I guarantee you, if you go to Him, He will not cast you out. He will not. Nobody ever came to Jesus and insisted on having something from Him. Did He ever turn them away? Whether you've committed the unpardonable sin or not, if you will lay hold on Him, you will be saved.